Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Some of you need to get out of the boat. Stop living to please everybody else. Follow your own heart and really do what you believe that God wants you to do. I'm teaching out of the Mark chapter 4 about the parable of the sower. And I've been reading the first half of it. But tonight I'm going to read a little bit of the second half where Jesus begins to explain what the parable means to his disciples. He says in verse 14, Mark 4, 14, the sower sows the word. The ones sown along the path are those who have the word sown in their hearts, but when they hear, Satan comes at once and by force takes away the message which was sown in them. We talked about that last night. And in the same way, the ones sown upon stony ground are those who, when they hear the word, at once receive and accept and welcome it with joy, but they have no real root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while, but when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately are offended, become displeased, indignant, resentful, and they stumble and they fall away. So these are more like the emotional believers. They get all excited about it. Sounds good. Sounds exciting. They're really excited, especially about the promises of God. But then when any kind of trouble or persecution comes, and, and, and it says on account of the word, not even because they're doing anything wrong, but just because they're trying to make progress, just because they're trying to go forward, persecution comes. The Bible promises us that we will be persecuted for righteousness sake and that when we are we should be happy and consider ourselves to be blessed. I know it's difficult to do that, but nonetheless in Matthew chapter 5 that particular scripture is repeated two times right in a row. That we will be persecuted for righteousness sake and when we are, we are extremely blessed. You know why? That puts us in good company with Jesus. Amen? And the one we're going to talk about tonight is the one sown among the thorns are others who hear the word. Then the cares and the anxieties of the world and the distractions of the age. Tonight we're going to talk about dealing with the distractions in our life that keep us from really focusing on what we're supposed to be focusing on and therefore we never really get the fullness of what God wants us to have. The cares and anxieties of the world, distractions of the age, pleasure and delight, false glamour, deceitfulness of riches, craving and passionate desire for other things creep in and choke. I like that creep and choke because Satan the creep comes in and tries to choke us <laughs> and suffocate the word and it becomes fruitless. Do you understand that? That means that we can sit on a church pew until our cute little bottom is flat. And everything we hear will bear no fruit if we don't know how to focus and really get the fullness out of what God is saying to us. Information is one thing, but what we need is revelation. And the only way that information becomes revelation is when we take it into ourselves and meditate on it and exercise it in our life and do what the Word says and see that it works and then we're able to bear fruit. Hearing alone is not enough. We must be hearers and doers of the Word. And you know, if you came here just to see what I look like in real life because you watch me on TV, <laughs> I want to tell you stuff that you have put yourself in a dangerous position because now you are learning something that you are going to be accountable for. What we hear, we become accountable for. It's going to require more than just saying amen because you're excited about the sermon. What an opportunity to grow. And those that are sown on good, well-adapted soil are those who hear the word, receive and accept and welcome it, and they bear fruit, some 30, 
some 60, and some 100 times as much as was sown. The reason why I decided to do this series is because I got curious about why if 10 people are all good soil, why some will reap 30, some 60, and some 100? I'm the kind of person, if 100 is available, then I don't want to settle for 30. I don't want to settle for 60. So the whole title of this series is Don't Settle for Less Than the Best. How many of you are getting the idea that you cannot settle for less than the best? You don't want to quit halfway to where God wants you to be. You want to go for everything that God has for you. And let me tell you something, I know that there are people here who are Word people, you're faith people, you've studied the Word, you believe the Word, you've put your faith in God, and you may be in a place right now where it just doesn't seem like it's worked for you. You've had trouble, you've had perhaps even tragedy, you've had one challenge after another, and I just want to encourage you. I believe that God brought you here to help you go over, not under. I believe that God brought you here so you would re-up, just like somebody who re-enlists in the army for another four years or eight years or whatever, and so you can say, devil, guess what? I'm not gonna quit, I'm not gonna give up. I am gonna believe God beyond reason, and I am gonna press through. I want you just to say, I'm just gonna take this like a brand new beginning. I don't care if I have to start all over fresh again with God. I'm not going to quit and give up. I'm not going to go back where I came from. Come on. I want you to get a new beginning tonight, a new determination, and say, I'm not going to quit, and I'm not going to give up. You know that in um, Hebrews 11, there's a whole chapter of people that we call the heroes of faith. And do you know, if you go and read those, which we're not going to take time to tonight, it says that they all died never having fully received the promise. Now, they saw God do great things, but they were looking forward to what we have today. They were looking forward to the Messiah coming, and they all died never having received the reality of their faith, but they died in faith. Will Christ find faith when He returns? You know what our goal should be? Two things. Faith and love. Faith and love. Faith and love. Keep your faith in God, love God, love people. Keep your faith in God, love God, love people. Keep your faith in God, love God, love people. My goal doesn't need to be to build a big ministry. Actually, when I was trying to build a big ministry, it wasn't growing. When I gave up and just started loving God, it just keeps, seems to just keep multiplying over and over and over and over. When you want something too much, if you want it for the wrong reason, God's not going to give it to you. Come on. But if you just love God, and you love people, and you stay focused on believing God, no matter what's going on in your life, it's amazing what God can do. I think sometimes we focus on the wrong things, and then we end up not getting what we want. Can anybody agree with me? I'll preach a little better if you agree with me. It's true, isn't it? You say, well, I am a person of faith. Well, if you don't have a good, strong love walk, then your faith's not working anyway. Yes, amen. I'm a person of faith. I'm a word person. Well, who are you mad at? Who do you need to forgive? The Bible says if you pray in faith, your faith is strong enough to move mountains. However, if you have anything against anyone when you pray, leave it, let it go, drop it. Totally forgive them so your Father in heaven might also forgive you. Last night I asked in here, in a room full of people this size, and a full overflow, and I said, how many of you in here need to forgive somebody? There was at least 85% of the hands that went up. And I don't care where I go, what auditorium, what church, I get the exact same response. And I can tell you, until we learn how to walk in faith and mix it with love, we are not going to get the result that we want to get from our walk with God. Do I need to say it again? Faith and love. Faith and love. I learned a whole lot about faith. For many years, I was taught a lot about faith. But I wasn't learning anything about love. And nothing was working in my life. 
The last 15 years, I've studied love. It's amazing what happens when you care about what God cares about the most. Now, dealing with distractions, I counted these things in Mark 4, 19. And there are six distractions that he mentions, things that will keep us from focusing on what we should focus on. How many of you realize that focus is extremely important? If we can't focus on anything, then our energies are divided up into a whole bunch of things, and we end up never doing anything really well. How many of you find it hard to focus when you try to pray? Wonder why. How many of you find it hard to focus when you try to study the Word? Wonder why. How many of you find it hard to focus when you're sitting and listening to somebody preach? Every time your mind leaves, you miss what's going on. And it's difficult to listen to somebody for one whole hour and keep your mind on everything that's being said the whole time. Satan is a master at distraction, and he knows exactly what he's trying to do. Because the minute our mind leaves, for all intent and purposes, we've gone. Amen? Matter of fact, they say that today, especially because there's so many distractions, that like on television, you only have like three seconds to get somebody's attention before they'll rush on to something else if you haven't said something that really interests them. So he says that there are cares, anxieties, distractions of the age, that's three things. Entertainment can distract us. Today, people are addicted to the need to be entertained. Do you know that? And to be honest with you, even in church, we want to be entertained. Kids think they should have entertainment every day, several hours of entertainment every day. We all think there's something wrong with our life if we're not entertained every day. And we need to not be addicted to entertainment. It's good to have fun, and it's good to nourish your emotions. But we don't want to be addicted to it. The deceitfulness of riches, passionate desire for other things, choke the word. Well, they, there's six here, but I've added a seventh. And it's all the technology that we deal with today. I put it all in one group. Email, text, Facebook, tweet, instant messaging, and whatever else is out there that I haven't found out about in the last two weeks. <laughs> and I think all these things are wonderful tools. I believe in many ways there are some of the things that are giving us the opportunity to spread the gospel all over the world. It is phenomenal how fast you can contact somebody today. Just, just think about when somebody used to, across the world, would have to write a letter and put it on a boat, and it might take literally months or a year to get to somebody. Now we pick up the phone and we can talk to somebody all the way around the world and it sounds just like they're sitting in the next room. It's amazing. So we want to use the things that are available to us, but we don't want to let them control us. How many of you sometimes think we go a little bit too far in needing to be available for every person that thinks that they got to contact us? I said last night, when did, we, when did any one of us get that important? When did any one of us get so important that everybody has to be able to find us every second of every day, and the moment that they ask us a question, I mean, you know how we are. You hear your phone beep in another room, you got to run and get it. We can't stand it if we don't know what somebody has said to us and quickly answer them. And I think that we're going to have to be very careful that we don't let it control us and disturb our focus to the point where we can't do anything. The best thing to do, turn the phone off when you're praying, spending your time with God. Best thing to do is make sure that you put yourself in a place where at times you can have quiet and not be available to everybody that wants to get to you all the time. Otherwise, we may lose our sanity. We need to stay focused. Proverbs 4, 25 through 27. Let your eyes look right on with fixed purpose and let your gaze be straight before you. I wrote next to my Bible, focus. Consider well the path of your feet 
and let all your ways be established and ordered aright and turn not aside to the right hand or to the left and remove your foot from evil. What's he saying? You need to know what you're supposed to be doing in life. You need to know what is important for you for the season that you're in in your life and you need to stay focused on that. I've heard people who teach leadership say that you should give 80% of your time to your top two or three strengths. Don't try to do so much that you can't do anything well. What are you supposed to be doing with your life? Have a purpose and do it on purpose. I believe that loving people is one of the most important things in the world and I do it on purpose. I don't wait to feel like it. I don't wait to want to. I do it on purpose. And I didn't do it for many, many years, but I do now because I've learned that loving people is the only way to be happy. If you want to make yourself happy, get yourself off your mind and focus on loving God and loving people. I said if you want to be happy, get yourself off your mind and focus on loving God and loving people. Amen. And I see all of you watching TV at home or watching me on the internet, and I'm talking to you too. If you want to be happy, focus on loving God and loving people. And by the way, you want to love yourself too. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you don't have a good relationship with you, then you're not going to have a good relationship with anybody else because you can't give away something you don't have. If you don't like you, you're not going to like anybody. Know your purpose. And you know we all have more than one purpose, but we need to know the most important purposes. Like the scripture I read you about faith and love. That's something to focus on as a believer. I want to stay in faith. I want to walk in love. If I can get up every day, stay in faith, and walk in love, I can go to bed that night and feel like that I have done what God wanted me to do. Stay in faith and walk in love. Lack of focus is a huge, huge, huge problem. We need to be decisive. You need to make decisions. And whatever it is you feel like you're supposed to be doing, you need to be fully committed to it. I talked last night about being fully committed, not just partially committed, but fully committed. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're not. Be hot, be cold, but don't be lukewarm. I like to say, get in, get out, or get run over. <laughs> we need to be on fire, passionate. I'm passionate about my preaching and teaching. I study for this. I pray for this. And I put my whole heart into this. And I enjoy it so much. I love what I'm doing. You know what? You cannot do a good job at anything if you're going to do it half-heartedly. You can't have a divided heart. That's why I said last night, if you've got a job you hate, then get another one. Don't spend your life doing something you hate. Even if you're making more money doing what you hate than you could doing what you love, I still recommend that you make less money and do what you love. We only have one trip through here. Don't waste your life on things that are useless. Don't waste your life gossiping and being jealous and being critical and murmuring and complaining and and having all kinds of opinions about everybody else's business. I've been there, done all that. And I finally lived long enough to outgrow most of it. Amen? That's why the Bible says you should listen to older people. They've been around long enough to have known what works and what doesn't. And I've decided that more than anything, all of us just really want to be happy. I mean, don't we? I mean, isn't that really the bottom line of what you want? You just really want to be happy. You want to enjoy your life. And so if you're spending your time doing something that you hate, that your heart's not in, then why don't you just make a change, find out what it is you can enjoy, and go do that. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing just because they want you to do it. Some of you need to get out of the boat, stop living to please everybody else, follow your own heart, and really do what you believe that God wants you to do.
James 1, 5 through 8. I feel like that there's some people here that need to make some decisions. You've been vacillating back and forth long enough, so I'm going to stick with this for just a minute. Who's in the building that's in, been in indecision for a while about something and you need to make a decision? Woo, lots of folks. Well, what if I make a mistake, Joyce? What if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? What if I miss God? What if I miss God? If you miss God, He'll find you. <laughs> Sometimes you never find out if you're right or wrong until you step out and try something. We're too worried about being wrong. If anybody's deficient in wisdom, verse 5, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproaching or fault finding and it will be given him. Only it must be what? In faith that he asks with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers, hesitates, and doubts is like the billowing surge out at sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. For being as he is a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irresolute, he is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything that he thinks, feels, and decides. So what's that scripture telling us? If we're not focused and have our whole heart on something, then God can't do anything for us. How many of you see that? If we're not focused, have our whole heart on what we believe that God wants us to do, then God can't do anything for us. Make a decision so God can get in line with you and help you. Ecclesiastes 5.1 says, give your mind to what you're doing. There's so many wonderful scriptures that talk about focus. You know, God even told Joshua when he told him to take Moses' place and lead the Israelites through the wilderness and into the promised land. He told him that he had to stay focused on what he was calling him to do. There's a lot of distractions out there, and you have to understand that one of Satan's goals is to distract you and keep you from doing what God wants you to do. If you can't focus, you can't grow. You need to focus on doing the right thing. Don't focus so much on what you've done wrong. Focus on doing something right. Why waste today focusing on what you did wrong yesterday? Because if you do that, that's going to steal your energy to do something right today. So today you'll do more, more wrong things, and the devil wants you then to waste tomorrow focusing on what you did wrong today. That's why the Bible says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Every day you ask God to forgive you for all your sins and mistakes, and then you don't mourn. Yes, we're sorry for the things we do wrong. But you don't mourn, you don't waste today thinking about yesterday you focus on doing what's right today. I spent so much of my early walk with God focusing on everything I did wrong. I talk too much. I do this. I do that. I'm hard to get along with. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. And I mean, I could just go all day long just thinking about everything that I did wrong. I don't mess with that stuff now. I get up every day and I focus on faith and loving God and treating people right. I focus in every situation to try to do what's right. And I know in the process of that, I do some wrong things. At the end of every day, I ask God to forgive me for all my sins. I bring it up again the next morning. I let it go, and I focus again on trying to do what's right that day. I believe some of you are wasting way too much of your time focusing on what you've done wrong, and it's stealing your energy to do what's right. Can I get a good amen out of anybody? You can be distracted from God by your own mistakes. And what he wants you to do is receive that forgiveness and go on. Receive forgiveness and go on. You can't do anything about what you have done, but you could improve today if you'll focus. Don't focus on the wrong things. Don't focus on what the devil's doing. Focus on what God's doing. Don't talk about what the devil's doing. Talk about what God's doing. Don't just talk about all the problems in the world. Find something good to talk about. Focus on what God is doing in your life and talk about that. Focus, don't focus on what you've lost in life. Focus on what you got left. Come on. 
don't, well, you know, I didn't have a good childhood, and I was abused growing up, and, you know, I didn't get a chance to have all the education I needed, and, you know, my parents didn't treat me right, and my first husband messed me around and ran around with another woman, and you know what? I had all that stuff happen to me, too. Every bit of it. I didn't have a good start, but I'm going to have a good finish. Come on. Maybe you didn't have a good start. Maybe you're not even have, having such a great time right now. But you know what? You can change your mind and change your attitude, and you can get focused on the future. You can let go of what lies behind, and you can press into the things that are ahead. Well, let's focus on following God and all the good things that He does for us instead of being distracted by the cares of this world. And remember, the main goal in life is to keep your faith in God, love Him, love yourself, and love people. The Bible says that we should abide in the love of God. That means live, dwell, and remain in it. I believe that God's got an awesome plan for your life, and I don't want you to settle for anything less than His best.